Hey everybody, this is Matt Atkinson, and you're watching Four Gettysburg with Aaron Smith. What is going on everybody? Aaron Smith here with Forward Gettysburg. Thank you guys so, so much for checking out the channel and for joining me today. Please remember to like and subscribe to the channel. I've been getting a lot of feedback from you guys. It seems like I am headed in the right direction with the channel. You guys seem to love it. So I really, really appreciate all your support. Don't forget, uh, for the next week, I have the 100 subscriber giveaway going on. So if you guys want the chance to win some great prizes, please check out that episode. It's the one with the screenshot that has the big red letters that says 100 subscriber giveaway. So make sure you check that out. I want to make sure that if you want to get some of those great prizes that you guys are entered into that. I'm giving away three books, three books uh, that I think are really, really awesome. And I think whoever wins it is going to to enjoy. So thank you guys so, so much for all of the great feedback. Before I get into the episode, I want to send a huge, huge thanks out to Eric Lindblade and Jim Hessler of the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. If you guys don't listen to the Battle of Gettysburg podcast, you need to. It's probably one of, if not the best podcasts about the Battle of Gettysburg, the Gettysburg area, all the amazing history that is here. So please make sure you guys are checking out that podcast. Um, also a huge shout out uh, again to both of them, to Eric for answering all of my questions um, on a late Sunday night. Uh, Eric, I appreciate you, man. And also Jim Hessler, who wrote an incredible book about sickles at Gettysburg. If you guys don't have that book, make sure you pick it up. It's an interesting read. It's a relatively short read, but it is chock full of great information. I am coming at you today from a little bit of a lesser known place on the Gettysburg battlefield. This is Munshower's Knoll. Now, off to my right, which would be the south, is the north face of Little Round Top. And off to my left, which would be the north, is going to be Cemetery Ridge. Munshower's Knoll would be named for the Munshower family who's going to have a farm just over that way. So today we are talking about Dan Sickles and we're going to get inside the mind of Dan Sickles just a little bit here. And we're going to talk about his move from this area to the peach orchard. So a little bit of background about Dan Sickles. Dan Sickles, um, as many people probably know, is a well-known womanizer. He was the political protege of James Buchanan. There is a story that he took one of his madams from New York that he was very close with, took her to England um, as an assistant to James Buchanan, who was the ambassador to England at the time, and actually introduced this madam to Queen um, Victoria. Dan Sickles is also well known for shooting his wife's lover, Philip Barton Key, descendant of the famous American Francis Scott Key, who of course wrote The Star-Spangled Banner. Now, you might be saying, eh, we know all this stuff about Dan Sickles. Why are you reviewing all this? Well, I want to present the idea. And this is not the first time the idea has been presented. Um, so that's why I gave a huge thanks to Eric and Jim at the Battle of Gettysburg podcast that Dan Sickles is an emotional decision maker. And that is going to be incredibly important to the story today. Dan Sickles thinks and he makes decisions with his emotions rather than his mind. Now, of course, we know Dan Sickles is not a West Point trained general. Dan Sickles is what we would call a political general. He has used his connections to rise up through the ranks of the Army of the Potomac. And here at Gettysburg on July 2nd, he is going to be a major general in charge of the Third Corps. He is going to be the only non-West Point trained general here that is so high up in the army here at Gettysburg. So Dan Sickles and his third corps, they're going to march here from Emmitsburg and they're going to be ordered to take positions right around this area stretching to the north. Now, previously that morning, Geary's division of the 12th Corps of the Army of the Potomac, they had occupied this area. However, George Meade is going to draw them away and put them over on Culp's Hill. Meade 
after day one, he was expecting a Confederate attack on his right flank. His right flank there, of course, being Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, that area of the battlefield. Meade suspected that because that area was so key to his developing plan here at Gettysburg. That was his route of retreat. The Baltimore Pike was his supply line and also the way that if things went bad here at Gettysburg, he was going to skedaddle on out of town back to the Pipe Creek line. If you guys don't know about the Pipe Creek line, I have an episode about that as well. Really, really interesting stuff. Something I'm definitely going to uh, visit again in the near future um, as I get through some of the back catalog of episodes that maybe didn't turn out as much uh, as, as nice as I would have liked them to. But either way, the right flank Meade sees as his key flank. He's not really worried so much about the left flank. He really isn't expecting a Confederate attack here on the left flank. So he's going to order the third corps to take positions here on the left flank. Now, the 3rd Corps' left flank would have rested right about in this area, um, possibly resting on the north slope of Little Round Top, certainly here on Munchauer's Knoll, and then extending north to about where the Father Corby Monument is, the Pennsylvania Monument is, modern day, there on um, Hancock Avenue. So Dan Sickles is going to take that position, and he's not really going to like it. So as you guys can see, behind me would have probably been about the original position that Dan Sickles is going to occupy on July 2nd. And as you can tell, it's rather low. There's not a, there's not a dominating feature. There's not a very prolific ridge or prolific hill on this part of the battlefield. It sinks down rather low. It's rather marshy and swampy. More importantly to Dan Sickles, there's not a great place to put his artillery. So Dan Sickles obviously is not going to be a huge fan of this. I firmly believe that Dan Sickles is haunted by two specters from the Battle of Chancellorsville. The first specter was the flank attack by Stonewall Jackson on May 2nd. Stonewall Jackson was able to move his troops through fairly wooded terrain relatively unseen. There were some scouts that did see some enemy movement, but they took it as a retreat. He was able to move his troops relatively unseen around the flank of the Army of the Potomac, around their right flank, and he was able to surprise the 11th Corps under Oliver Otis Howard there at Chancellorsville. And he was able to smash that 11th Corps and send them running, giving them the unfortunate nickname of the Flying Dutchman. The second specter that I believe is haunting Dan Sickles at Gettysburg is going to be the specter of Hazel Grove. Now, Hazel Grove itself, it was a uh, geographical feature that was like a small plateau, uh, but being a small plateau, a relatively uh, a nice sized rise with a relatively flat surface, it was an excellent, excellent platform for artillery. And Dan Sickles actually recognized that and had artillery placed there but during the Battle of Chancellorsville, through a series of overly cautious decisions by Joe Hooker, Dan Sickles is going to be ordered to retreat his men from Hazel Grove. Seeing this opportunity, the Confederate artillery is then going to take Hazel Grove and they're going to be able to bombard and pound Dan Sickles retreating Third Corps as they're leaving that geographical area of the Chancellorsville battlefield. So Dan Sickles, I firmly believe, is haunted by these two things from Chancellorsville. And looking at the position, we can see exactly why. First off, he's here on the left flank. He's forgotten about on the left flank. We can get a little bit into the Meade-Sickles dynamic. Dan Sickles, during his military career, he was very good friends with people like Joseph Hooker and Daniel Butterfield, um, Chief of Staff for Joseph Hooker and also Chief of Staff here at Gettysburg for George Gordon Meade, though Meade wasn't certainly too pleased about it. These guys 
they're going to be having a good old time with the Army of the Potomac. They are going to, you know, be drinking every night, be engaging in um, sins of the flesh, if you will. In fact, it's described that the Army headquarters was more of a bordello than it was an actual headquarters. So you get the idea of this frat boy, um, you know, party time kind of dynamic that these guys are having. So George Gordon Meade, he's going to kind of detest that. And he's also going to detest that Sickles is a political general. He's not West Point trained. Who is this guy to command an entire corps of my army when he doesn't even have the military education that everybody else has? So Dan Sickles, he's going to feel like he's forgotten about on this left flank. He's going to feel like he was put out of sight, out of mind. And that worries Sickles because that's exactly what, what Hooker did with the 11th Corps at Chancellorsville. And when we look at this area, we can see is there's woods. Behind us, there's woods. It would be an incredibly easy thing for the Confederate Army to do to sneak up on Dan Sickles at this position and crush his core. The other thing as well, like I was mentioning, is kind of this low swale here. It's not a lot of great ground, and it's especially not a lot of great ground for artillery. When you have artillery, you want to make sure you have an excellent field of fire. You want to be able to see the enemy. You want to be able to pour volleys upon them that are going to be effective so you're not wasting ammunition, and when that enemy eventually comes up and attacks you, their numbers are going to be dwindled down just a little bit, and they might just might just reconsider their attack. Dan Sickles absolutely hates this position. He's going to describe it as a hole. Sickles' hole is directly behind me, and he's not going to like it very, very much. So what Sickles is going to do is he is going to send a courier. He's going to send a messenger to George Gordon Meade at headquarters, and he's going to say, Meade, I'm not really feeling this position, man. Um, but as we were marching up, I saw this nice little plateau there near the peach orchard, um, near the Sherfy farm. I think that would be a pretty awesome position to take. And Meade's going to blow him off. Dan Sickles, I got an army to run. I got to worry about my right flank. You know, just hang out where I told you to hang out at. Don't worry about it. Dan Sickles, of course, is not going to appreciate that response. So Dan Sickles is then going to ask for Governor K. Warren, chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac, to come out here and see the position, see the issues with the position, and see the new position that he wants to take. And Governor K. Warren is going to say, Dan Sickles, man, I'm busy. I got stuff going on. We're doing engineer stuff. You know, just stay where you're at. Don't worry about it. Then Dan Sickles is going to go back to headquarters and he's going to press chief of artillery, Henry Hunt. And Henry Hunt is going to entertain Sickles and he's going to come out here and he's going to agree with Sickles. You know, this is not a great spot for artillery. I agree. I, I give you that. And then they're going to ride forward to the peach orchard and Dan Sickles is going to show him his proposed line, the line that he wants to have. And Hunt's going to look at the peach orchard and say, yeah, you know, this would be pretty good. This would be pretty good for artillery. You know, I, I'll give you that. And Dan Sickles is going to ask him, do I have your permission or authority of George Gordon Meade to move my corps forward? And Hunt's going to hesitate and say, no, no, I can't give you that. I can't give you that. But, you know, I do agree with you. This is good ground. So at this point, Dan Sickles is feeling rebuffed by Army headquarters. He is afraid of a flanking attack. Perhaps afraid is not the best word, but he's concerned about a flanking attack. And he also doesn't have great position for his artillery. So Dan Sickles is eventually going to make a move that will define the second day of combat here at Gettysburg. So right about in this area would have been the center of Dan Sickles' original line. And as you guys can see, they are not great sight lines for artillery. This is a field, but it's rather marshy and swampy. It's not a great place for troops to be put. Now, up above me is some slight hills, but it's very rocky. It's very, um, it's not, again, not great terrain to post troops. Dan Sickles is very much worried about his sight lines. As you can see, there are hills, 
there are trees over there. There's no view of oncoming troops. And that's truly what Sickles is worried about. Sickles is worried about a surprise attack from the Confederates. He has no view in front of him. He just has woods there. There's the Weikert farm down this direction, which is a little bit further north. Now the landscape starts to clear up just a little bit there, but, but again, this is not a great position for troops, and this is going to really affect Dan Sickles' decision to move forward to the Peach Orchard. So right about in this area would have been where Dan Sickles' right flank of his third corps would have rested. But right behind the camera is the Father Corby Monument, of course the father of the famed Irish Brigade, who would later see action on July 2nd as a direct result of Dan Sickles' choice to move the Third Corps forward. Directly behind me, of course, you can make out the Pennsylvania Monument. Some keen-eyed viewers may even be able to make out Cemetery Hill over there in the distance. So this would have been the far left flank of the Second Corps, and this would have been the far right flank of the Third Corps. Of course, once we get out here, we see that, yeah, things do clear up a little bit. We do have some great sight lines, but again, this is the far right flank of the core. And this is not the only position that Dan Sickles is intended to hold. They want him to hold the area going all the way down there to where we started at Munchower's Knoll and the north slope of Little Round Top. And throughout that area, as I've discussed, and I, as I am discussing, it is incredibly inhospitable to effective artillery placement and it's incredibly marshy and swampy and as Sickles describes it, it's just a hole. So, we've seen a little bit about where Dan Sickles was originally supposed to place his third corps. Let's go explore a little bit where his corps ends up at. Currently standing within the famed peach orchard. This was the position that Dan Sickles truly had his eye on on July 2nd. And Dan Sickles is eventually going to make an emotional decision, as we discussed earlier, to move his third corps to this position. As you can see, the peach orchard has some pretty amazing sight lines. He can see what's coming from all around him. Not only that, but this is an excellent platform for artillery. It's a relatively flattened plateau, plenty of room to space out the guns. When a Civil War era cannon would fire, it could recoil as much as 8 to 12 feet. So the artillerymen would have to wheel these cannons back into the original position by hand. That's why a lot of places like Little Round Top and a lot of these very spiny, spiny hills on the Battle of Gettysburg on the field here aren't exactly great artillery platforms. But the Peach Orchard itself is an excellent, excellent artillery platform. So what Dan Sickles is going to do is he's going to move his corps forward sometime around 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And he's going to make what is a salient. The salient here would have been directly behind the camera here along modern day Bernie Avenue. And he's going to have Bernie's division stretching all the way from this salient all the way down to Devil's Den. Now that division had three brigades in it. Three brigades were expected to cover an immense, an immense amount of real estate. It just wasn't feasible. From this end of the salient, it would have stretched along the Emmitsburg Road there, up past the Sherfy Barn. You might be able to make out the Sherfy Farm and the Sherfy Barn there in the distance. It would have stretched up the Emmitsburg Road there. That would have been Humphrey's division. Altogether, Dan Sickles would have moved his entire corps about three quarters of a mile away from the far left flank of the second corps. Now, what does that do? That makes this area an almost unholdable position. Sure, it's a great artillery platform, but now any type of reinforcements or support or reserve is now three quarters of a mile away. And in Civil War times, you know, you couldn't just airdrop guys in from a helicopter and call it a day, of course. You know, it, it took time to move people across the battlefield. So this really wasn't a great position. He also created a salient. Now a salient is so, is such a tactically bad position because at a salient, you, 
when the enemy attacks, they can fire from one end and end up hitting the other end of your salient. So they could be taking out, you know, two rows of men instead of just the normal, you know, the one row attacking head on. So a salient is not a great position. But nonetheless, Dan Sickles, he loves this position. He's going to see it as he comes in from Emmitsburg and he's going to absolutely adore the peach orchard. The peach orchard itself and the Sherfy farm as well rests on what we like to call the Emmitsburg Road Ridge. And if you ever come north to Gettysburg on the Emmitsburg Road, it is a domineering feature. It is a large hill. It is in some places um, higher than Cemetery Ridge itself. It's certainly higher than Seminary Ridge by, by probably quite a few yards. So this is a domineering land feature here on this end of the battlefield. And that's why Dan Sickles wants it so much. He's being haunted by those specters of Chancellorsville. He doesn't want to be surprised on the flank. He feels like George Meade has left him out of sight, out of mind. He's feeling, he's feeling scorned from headquarters. And he also doesn't have a great artillery platform for his guns. So that's why this position is going to be so key. And of course, Dan Sickles moving his third corps forward here to the peach orchard, creating a salient, stretching all the way down to the wheat field and to Devil's Den. It is going to be the catalyst for an incredible amount of carnage here at Gettysburg. Well, guys, thank you so, so much for joining me. I hope this video was very informative to you. Of course, Dan Sickles and why did he move his troops to the Peach Orchard is always one of those questions that haunts Gettysburg historians. So I hope I was able to maybe impart some knowledge, uh, give you guys some ideas, some thoughts, some facts, some historical basis that maybe you didn't realize or maybe you didn't know about. As always, I am your host, Aaron Smith, for Forward Gettysburg, and I will catch you on the next one.